welcome to yet another inspirational episode of Beyond Show, and I am your host, Dr. Sonia Balia. And today, I am honored and thrilled to have a well-recognized global leader, a passionate scientist, and a huge inspiration for all the researchers out there, Professor Rajiv Varshney. Professor Varshney is currently serving Murdoch University as a director of Center for Crop and Food Innovation and State Agricultural Biotechnology Center and as International Chair in Agriculture and Food Security with the Food Futures Institute. Before joining Murdoch University, he served uh, ICRISAT for about 16 years in diverse science and leadership roles. He did his master's from Aligarh Muslim University and he has done his PhD under the supervision of Professor P.K. Gupta at Chaudhary Charan Singh University, Meerut. He is globally recognized for his work on genomics, cataloging and utilizing genetic diversity, molecular breeding and genetic engineering, trade discovery and capacity building in developing countries, especially for orphan crops. He has made centrally important contributions towards improving food and nutrition security in India and several countries in Africa and Asia by assembling genomes, developing genomic resources and integrated genomic technologies in crop improvement programs in many tropical crops. He is internationally recognized for his contribution in genome sequencing of pigeon pea, chickpea, peanut, pearl millet, sesame, moong bean and alzuki bean and the development of molecular breeding products in chickpea, pigeon pea and peanut. Further, he is highly prolific author and clarivate highly cited researcher for nine consecutive years in a row since 2014. He is the only agricultural plant scientist in India and the only translational plant biologist in Australia to achieve an H index of more than 100 as per Google Scholar. He published more than 400 articles in highly reputed journals and in addition to several books with reputed publication houses. He is an elected fellow of several national as well as international scientific and academic societies. Recently, he became the fourth agricultural scientist to be elected as the fellow of the Royal Society, joining the list with uh, Professor B.P. Pal, Professor M.S. Swaminathan and Professor Gurudev Kush. He has a long list of prestigious national and international awards and honors in his name, including the well-deserved Science Award Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize and the most prestigious Agricultural Science Award Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Award from the Government of India and several other international awards. It's not possible for me to summarize his contributions and achievements to the agricultural science and crop improvement within the time frame of this episode. So without a further ado, I welcome you, sir, to be on show and thank you so much for accepting my invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to interact with you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonia Balian, and I'd really like to thank you and Beyond the Show the, for interviewing me, and you guys are doing a remarkable job for inspiring the next generation of scientists, dissemination of scientific knowledge, and I'm very much excited to be part of your episode. So thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. So, sir, uh, my first question to you is, first of all, uh, courteous congratulations to you for becoming the fourth, fourth agricultural scientist to be uh, elected as fellow of World Society. Uh, how do you feel after receiving highest uh, recognitions and honors for your contribution? Thank you. And let me tell you that I really feel humbled and honored to be elected as that uh, fellow of the Royal Society and especially when I'm listed with those pioneers or agricultural sciences join of India, including Professor B.P. Paul, Professor Swaminathan, and Professor Gurdev Ko. So it really gives me great pleasure because when I was studying, we always heard their name with huge respect. And now when I'm in that category, so I really feel very honored. But at the same time, I should also mention that I feel that this is not just recognition of Rajiv Varshney, but this is in fact recognition of our collaborative research. What I did when I was at Kriset, and with our collaborative research partner from Indian Council of Agriculture Research, universities in India and globally, because we have been working with large number of partners around the world. So, and I should also mention that my previous organizations, ICRISAT and currently Murdoch University, but in addition to them, other organizations like IPK, CCS University, Aligarh Muslim University, they played a very important role. So I'm really honored. When I say that, I feel very excited, happy, but at the same time, 
such kind of honors they also brings lots of responsibility as well and also the expectation that we need to do more and we really need to work towards ensuring food and nutrition security for ever growing population and each of us can contribute something and my job is now to do much more what i have been doing in the past so thank you once again true sir true sir it is a collaborative effort but Yes, your uh, leading capacities again uh, found in marketing. So, sir, you have had this uh, remarkable career in agricultural science through harnessing the application of modern genomics assisted uh, plant breeding approaches, providing solutions for crop improvement, including uh, the orphan crops. Can you please share with us your current uh, research interest and the vision throughout your journey? Yeah, so this is a very good point. And what happens that agriculture is very important because you know that if you would like to see two important basic needs for society, then there are two important things. One is food, second is health. Regarding health, we all have seen the importance during this COVID period. In terms of agriculture, we know that even that era in India, 1960s or so, that during that, just before the Green Revolution, that when population was growing with alarming rate, we did not have enough food, but at that time point, we had the green revolution, which made India self-reliant or we now India is self-reliant. Rather, India is one of the major exporter country for agriculture as well. So these things are happening. But now what I want to tell that population is continuously growing. And right now we don't have just challenge for the food, but also the important thing is nutrition. Yes. And we know that we need to have the immunity and all these things. Now in this regard, how? we can continue to contribute uh, in this agriculture side so we can have enough produce we can have enough food to feed 10 million population by 2050 in this regard plant breeding other agriculture science discipline they have been doing remarkable job but now we cannot continue as business as usual we need to bring some new approaches so that our rate to deliver these uh, outputs can be enhanced and in this direction genomics can play a very very important role yes, with this premise we started this journey when i was in ipk gutters 11 way back in 2005 followed this thing in ecreset and i can tell later that well how we use this kind of research in so-called orphan crops because sometimes crops like chickpea pigeon pea yes. peanut pearl millet sorghum so these crops they are important for the smallholder farmers yes, now if we would like to do two things, one is that helping farming community so that mm. they can generate more profit from these crops. Second, we need to feed the world with this nutritious crop. So in this direction, I believe that we need to use the modern genomics approaches and the approach where you are using genomics in breeding. I call it genomics assisted breeding. While working at Tickly said we have demonstrated its utility to deliver the better varieties which are grown by poor farmers in India, many countries in Asia and Africa. And now going forward, how we can accelerate this gain further. So I think that this is some of that focus of my research that how we understand the genomes. And most important thing is integrate the genome discoveries for the crop improvement. So that's what I would like to say. So currently, what are your research focus? It is still on the orphan crops or now you're working on some other research? Yeah. So now when I'm in here in Australia, so in Australia, I'm, I'm working with the Murdoch University in Western Australia. So Western Australia is a province, one of the most important agriculture growing state in Australia. We grow wheat, barley, canola, chickpea, many crops. Wheat being very important crop across the world. Yes. Now the focus of my research in terms of the crops is wheat and also some pulses crop on which I was working earlier like chickpea etc, lentil and on top of that we are also working now the horticultural crops because we know that for nutrition the horticultural yes. crops, the fruits are very important. So I believe that while working on these aspects through wheat we are providing the calories of carbohydrates or so we are providing the protein through the pulses. And now we can provide the nutrition through the horticulture crop. So now these are the three things have come together. And I should also mention that though we are working here in Australia, but you know that science does not have the boundary. Research outputs, they don't have the boundary. So if we work here in Australia, they're also helping the community in India and other countries. As you mentioned in my introduction, 
I am also serving here the Food Future Institute as International Chair in Agriculture and Food Security. So my job is how can I connect agriculture research being undertaken in Australia to the different parts of the world. So that's the major focus. Definitely, sir, because your work is uh, still contributing and in these areas also, uh, people would get the benefit. So, sir, what yes. motivates you to choose agricultural sciences and uh, the area of orphan crops? And what is yeah. their significance? Yeah, so very good point. And I can tell that I grew up in India in a state called Uttar Pradesh and where we are having still poverty and many smallholder farmers. I have seen those farmers uh, very closely. And one thing is, and now things have improved a lot in our country, mm -hmm. in India. But earlier when I know, so farmers, they are growing different crops which are feeding the society, but generally they are smallholder farmers. They are poor, they don't have much resources. So they were always taking the loans and these things with the hope that they will have the produce, they can pay the loan and this. Mm -hmm. But every year, either there is a failure of the crop because of drought, they don't get anything. Even if they got the good rain and your bumper production of the crop, then market price goes down, then they also not making the money. This always kept on thinking in my mind that, well, why we are not able to help the farmers that they should consider that they are making some money. They are being, So these are the thing. Anyway, these were the, in my primary school, secondary school. At that time, I did not think that I will become agriculture scientist. But I thought that why farmers are sad or they are not making these things. But at that time, being very young kid, you know, at that time, we used to read a lot of comics as well. And I remember that in those comics, uh, we used to read about these, for instance, the different galaxy planets. So... I got very much fascinated that, well, sometimes I need to become some space scientist or so. So I wanted to do that one. But as things move further and I was studying that in BSc or so, I started to develop my interest in agriculture, but more that to understand genes, genomes, like these kind of things. That's what I did in my PhD and postdoc. That's okay. But when I was in Germany, and this was, I'm talking, I stayed in Germany from 2000 to 2005. In 2003, I had an opportunity to attend a conference in Bologna in Italy. This conference name was from Green Revolution to Gene Revolution. In this meeting, I met several important agricultural scientists, including Norman Borlaug, who was the father, who is the father of uh, Green Revolution. Also, Professor Swaminathan, Professor Gurdev Kosh, many people. This was very inspiring. But then I remember, and those words still echo in my ears, when Norman Borlaug, and they say that his research benefited millions of the lives in Asian countries. And he told, this is great that we are having fantastic science advances. And he says, I challenge the next generation of scientists to embrace new technologies, gene technology in the crop improvement. At that time point, I thought, hey, I'm working here in Germany, improving malting quality of barley because you know that beer is very good quality in Germany, but I do not drink beer. But having said that, I thought that Norman Borlaug, he's really putting very nice question in front of all of us and what we can do, how we can do. And then I moved back to that with that help of uh, uh, helping that uh, country or the different thing. I moved back to India. And when I was going to India, I got opportunity to work at ICRISAT. ICRISAT used to work on those five crops, which are called orphan crop. In Hindi, they are called chana and pigeon pea arhar, peanut mufli, and bajra and jowar. And in these crops, for these crops, they are grown only in those areas where you cannot grow wheat or rice or yes. etc. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, so you need to know that very marginal lands. In those areas, when you are growing these crops, the productivity is very low. So then I took up this as a challenge that this is the right time. And this is the culmination of several thoughts, including from Dr. Norman Borlaug, my bringing up in Uttar Pradesh state, that now this is the right opportunity, how we can help the farming community, especially growing those orphan tropical crops. So then we thought, what we can do? And as I came from Germany at that time point, genomic science was very advanced. I started to think that we need to do something. And when we thought to work on the chickpea, pigeon pea, pearl millet, etc., 
we did not have much advanced research in these crops. I joined in 2005. For next two years, I kept on thinking, what should I be doing? And I was talking with many leading scientists in India, and I was talking, can we do this? Can we do that? They say, are you crazy? In these crops, we don't have anything. What you can do? So there were lots of challenges like that. But after 2007, in 2007, we were very lucky. We got a grant from Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. We established the Center of Excellence in Genomics in 2007. After that, I started to work with different partners, got different grants from Ministry of Agriculture and also some grants from Gates Foundation. And then we started to have the network collaboration. And I think this changed that little bit direction of my research. And we started to grow a lot of resources. And then what happened that in during these next few years, we developed a lot of genomics research. But the next point was that how we can use this genomics, we can publish the paper, which is yes. okay. But to disseminate the scientific knowledge, however, the most important point is how, what we can contribute to the society. So from this perspective, we started to work with the breeders in India and many countries in Africa, thanks to many funding organizations, especially Gates Foundation, Ministry of Agriculture, Department of Biotechnology, Syngenta Foundation, Generation Challenge Program, US and many things. But in the end, we were able to integrate those genomic discoveries. We delivered the varieties and the significance of these crop is that they are very nutritious crop. Yes. Now you know that this year we are celebrating International yes. Year of Yes. Yeah? And we decoded the genome sequence of millet. We developed several improved varieties for chickpea, pigeon pea. And now they are reaching to the farmer's field. So Miss Sonia, when you ask this question to me that how I'm feeling about this FRS, which is really very good news, happy news. But I feel always very excited and happy whenever any variety is reaching to the farmer's field sure. and that variety is delivered through our efforts. Then that's mm -hmm. given me much more happiness, much more excitement that our research now is going to some practical aspects and going to the farmers and farming community will be benefited. Very well said, sir, because these, these are the aspects which we really want at this time to translate your research into some uh, benefit to the farmer because ultimately the farmer who is doing all of uh, these production but usually the research just confined to lab and they didn't get the benefits so it is yes the uh, very necessary steps and yes your research are translating into uh, a benefit to the farmers so sir uh, related to that all of these things are happening then how did your upbringing or the family values or your family or the mentors uh, they, uh, their contribution shaped you as a researcher? Yeah, no, I think this is a very good question, good point. And I really feel very privileged that I had many mentors in my life who have influenced me one way or the other. Some of them, they have been my formal mentors, supervisors, some of them informally, but I have been very lucky. I had very heavy influence of my mom, my mother, and several supervisors. I would like to list my mother, so then you, I, uh, you want to name your mother? Yeah, yeah. So my mother name, she is no more now, but I miss her and her name is Bhagwan Devi. Yeah. So she was very pious lady. And then I remember when I was a small uh, young boy, she used to tell us the story. She used to read Gita part every day. And then she used to tell a lot of stories. One thing she used always used to give some of those lessons kind of things. So, and I will share some of them. So for instance, this hard work. Huh? And she used to tell, and I have been, I I was born in a very middle class or poor family, if you would like to say. And then she used to tell, and this is very interesting, and she was not educated, but now whenever I see her lessons and I see this, she was a very intelligent lady. So she used to say to all of us, my brother, sister, so she used to say that, well, how you are born, like poor, rich, or you are born beautiful or handsome or not, or with the intelligent, some people not intelligent, some people, this is, this is, everything is Bhagwan ki den hai. Isme aap kuch nahi kar sakte hai. But she used to say, you can do one thing. You can change, you can defy several of things by your hard work. Hard work is in your hand and by doing the hard work continuously without having lots of expectation and probably this is coming from Gita. They say that, well, you should keep on always working hard and doing something and with and always keep on helping other people 
And so she used to tell many things. Many times we used to ask her that why we should be helping people. And if they are the as a small boy, that if I'm helping, this means that person is below than me. So what he or she will give back to me? She says, I'm telling the current system. She did not know at that time point or she did not tell me in that way. She used to say this word is like an ecosystem. She did not use the word ecosystem, but she meant to like that. So this ecosystem means that you are helping someone who is below you. You will not realize, but Bhagwan is dunya mein aisa hai ke wo aapki help upar se karega. So you are lifting somebody from the ground. Somebody else is lifting you from the top. So I mean, those kind of things he used to give me. Sonia ji, you will not believe. And uh, then I also learned a lot of hard work from my another PhD supervisor, Professor P.K. Gupta, very hardworking person. He's professor even at the age, I'm mean, working very hard even at the age of 82 years at the Meerut University. Wonderful person. He taught me that what this means hard work and he is still doing it at the age of 82. Anyway, the third supervisor, which are, I would like to mention that to my PA postdoc supervisor, Andreas Graner. When I was coming to India in 2005, I asked him, Andreas, I'm going back to India. I would like to become a successful leader like you are. Please give me some tips. What can I do that I can be successful? I can grow in my career. He told Rajiv, never ever think to do any specific thing for yourself. You just take care of growth of the people who are working with you. Either they are PhDs, postdocs, your colleagues and research collaborators, anybody. If you will contribute to the growth of those people, your career will automatically grow. Automatically. So you see, Sonia Ji, that my mom, who was not educated, her teaching were more or less same, what yes. Andreas told me. And he is from Germany. And then when I came to Ikri, said this was my key thing. This is not important that what Rajiv needs to do for himself or like that. But the most important thing, what Rajiv can do for other people. So either this in that my professional life or even when I'm talking, my clientele, like smallholder farmers, my collaborators. So I think some of these things I kept on doing. And the third thing is I used to like to mention my two other very important super mentor. One is that uh, my, there were many teachers, but would like to mention Professor Vajahat Hussain from Aligarh Muslim University. Wonderful person. He always brought me on the right direction. He was the one who showed me that research. So if you see supervisors, Vajahat Hussain, P.K. Gupta, hard work, and that very good thing that how we should be helping other people, Andreas Graner. Then my current supervisor, Professor Peter Davis, wonderful person. Mm -hmm. And for everything he wants to say, Raji, for every problem, we have the solution. Let's discuss. Let's do that mm -hmm. one. In addition to that one, I would like to mention the contribution of my family, especially my wife, Monica. She is also wonderful scientist. She was wonderful scientist. But she sacrificed her career for myself. And she took care of that leading the role in the managing the family. If she wouldn't have sacrificed, though many times I kept on telling that you need to start working or you need to do this. And she says, no, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to see you doing these things. If both of us will work, then this is, I mean, having this wonderful career, but she sacrificed herself. And now we have two children. And I think many times in my current job of the last several years, when I was leading big project, they were very time demanding, but they did not complain too much and then they always feel very proud when they say that well this is happening that's happening so i think my family starting from my mom my dad and my teachers my different mentors i mentioned only few mentors but several lastly i think i will be failing that if i do not mention that i mentioned earlier also my wonderful colleagues and collaborators with whom i have been working for last 20 years or so and i think these were the key people and sometimes I feel that as a leader, my job is to put the different parts of the pieces of the puzzles together. But these people, they were bringing these things together. So I, as I said, Sonia Ji, that I think I am one of those privileged person. I don't think that I'm very smart or intelligent person. There are many more people in this world who are much more smart or intelligent. But I think I'm lucky person. I'm privileged one. And God has been very, very kind to me. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you for asking this very good question. True, away sir. from science but that's really yes. important thank you so because uh the channel name is beyond show so we will discuss show, <laughs> yes. but okay. also the story uh behind the show so that's very important that yeah. again uh, realize how the families are supporting so sir your yeah. kids they realize that 
their father is such a giant scientist and ఉంటాయి <laughs> when they put varshne or rajiv varshne they find lots of pages lots of information about me they say oh your dad is this or this thing like those kind of things so sometimes this puts a lot of pressure on children but that's okay but they feel very happy very inspired so that my that they think that our dad is contributing to the society so not only just generating knowledge but also doing something for that society this this makes them very proud i should say that they, they silently observe and yeah. imbibe all the you know <laughs> these values from you and yeah without and so, and some of those points which you had mentioned like i mentioned a few points related to my mom or so so my when i go to drop my daughter in school and driving or so we always keep on talking and then those kind of things so you see that what my mom I keep on telling those things to my kids and that's the way that how we can cultivate those family values yes this next generation of children and yeah. that is very necessary sir because yeah. connecting with your roots is ultimately very important uh, yeah. very important and uh, yes it should be there so very well said sir and very well elaborated answer that is what i am expecting <laughs> <laughs> because uh, so sir uh, tell us about your research at ecreset and how do you access the impact of your research on the livelihood of farmers and also consumers yeah. especially in terms of nutrition food security yeah sustainability yeah i think this is very important and this is also gives me lots of uh, proud feeling so at ikri said when we were working and these five crops as i mentioned but mainly i was working on the three legume crops crop productivity was very low when i started working in 2005 less than 1 ton per hectare when i left ikri said i will not say that this ha- all everything happened just because of me mm-hmm. number of things but i feel that i contributed a lot in this direction as well as a team and as a leader so in many crops the issue was that these crops are grown by small holder farmers when they are exposed to a range of stresses challenges abiotic stress like drought heat many biotic stresses what so be decoded the genome sequence of all these crops be understood the function of the genes which are making a particular crop drought tolerant or drought susceptible we also developed so by using these genomic research we developed the varieties and i'm so happy to mention that more than 15 varieties for chickpea pigeon pea and peanut now they have reached to the farmers in india in many countries in africa in, and they are producing higher or they are delivering higher productivity but more than that even from the nutrition perspective in the case of peanut or groundnut we have delivered the high oleic peanut varieties because they are the oil seed crops mm. and generally what happens if you see the oil seed then you are having that three different acid there palmitic acid linoleic acid and oleic acid so linoleic acid is not good for health but generally you get that 30% oil is made of the linoleic acid but what we did from the health perspective we delivered the varieties which are having 90% oleic acid just less than 10 or 20 less than 10% linoleic acid so like those ones so some of these varieties they have reached to the farmers so this is one impact the second important thing is which many times we don't realize in many times but country like india things have improved a lot but i'm talking because as ikri said i used to work in the developing countries i led one big project from bill and melinda gates foundation that was worth of 27 million dollar in this project we run this project in 13 different countries in africa two countries in asia india and bangladesh and 13 in africa what we did that many times scientists they did produce the varieties but these varieties do not reach to the farmers and what happened the seeds delivery system is not very strong as a part of this project what we did mainly we worked with the government agencies ngos and we worked in three aspects one how we can strengthen the breeding program breeding pipeline that breeding programs can deliver the varieties faster second how we can strengthen the seed delivery system so that if 
if somebody released the variety in 2020, farmers are not waiting to receive this variety 10 years later, but they should be receiving in 2010 or 2011, like that one, so that they can really harness the value of research. Third is the capacity building, capacity building of the scientists, but also farmers. So even when farmers are given the varieties, they need to know about the agronomy packages. For instance, in which month they should be doing sowing, when they should do the irrigation, when they should do the pesticide. And even when you got the crops, when they should be harvesting, so they should not have the post-harvest losses. Not only that one, Sonia, see, the most important thing is that how you can connect the farmers to the market so that sometimes farmers, they produce, but then middlemen makes the money. Farmers, that still do not make the money. And now in the Indian, our country in India, I found people are talking market. always that are now government, Honorable Prime Minister Modi, he has challenged that enhance the profitability of the farmers, doubling the farmers' income, not the productivity. And for doing these things, farmers need to have the knowledge about the market. So connect them to the market through the digital agriculture. So, so be involved in all these things. And now I can say that by using these kind of technology or so, this project help. This is a big project run for about, I think, 10 years or so. This project helped to deliver more than 250 varieties, more than 500,000 tons seeds. And this project produced the grains which are worth for $2.5 billion. So this, this was a big project. This project the lives of about 25 million people. And for all this great work, my former institute, ICRIS, had got the Africa Food Prize. I was elected in the fellow of the African Academy of Science of many things. So I think some of these kind of impact, which is not only in the science, science like publication, our research has been published in many journals, more than 20 articles in the different nature journals, which is good, especially for the young generation who were the part of those research articles. They got fantastic position all around the world. But more than that, this research now is in public domain. Anybody can read, anybody can see. If you will not publish, this will be just restricted to your computer, not good. But on top of that, Delivering varieties, helping farming community, this is the impact. And I think these are the kind of impact they are making in terms of generating income, food security, nutrition, environmental sustainability, because we are working on the legume crops. We need to think about reducing the carbon footprints, water footprints, because we are talking about the environmental sustainability, just not the producing more and more, but how we can take care of these things. So that's what I would like to say. So, sir, whenever uh, you may visit the fields and, and you uh, got the chance to hear uh, feedback from the farmers. Directly. Yeah. So. Yeah. And this is so, and when, even when I was going, visiting different places, I have worked very closely with the farmers, interact with them. Now, even now I'm here in Murdoch for last one and a half years, but I already visited several times India interacted with several breeders, interacted with the different farming organizers. So they always feel very excited, happy, and always would like to see more. But the good thing is that we already have established a foundation for these legume countries. So even I come here now, but the varieties that are still coming more and more because this was the product of last few years. So I think, and that's what we also did. Another thing which uh, I would like to mention that from the Indian perspective, the scientists, the breeders, they are doing great job, but if they are not, but what additional thing we did, we did the capacity building. So we trained more than 500 mm. scientists from India and other places to take up this new technology in the breeding program. So even I'm here, but we already created a next generation of scientists and now they are taking this thing to the next level. So I think this is something great impact which our research has made. Sir, so after joining uh, here, uh, how your association and role contribute to the vision of ICRISAT and India? Yeah. In this regard, I would like to say, though I have come out from India, but you cannot take ICRISAT or India out from me. So they are always very Sir, close India, to my heart. India <laughs> <jane ne dega. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And recently when I was in, in India in that uh, some other meeting of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, I was so pleased to know that one that they have felicitated me and at all the highest platform, like either this is National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, Indian Agriculture Research Institute, and also that uh, PPBFRA and uh, many other organizations. So I was feeling so happy and uh, Indian Society of Plant Genetic Resources, many people, and also 
people like professor pentel professor malti lakshmi kumaran professor p k gupta many people so whenever i was meeting they were so proud of me then i feel so much honored and humbled to receive those blessings from them so what i'm saying so i'm very much in closely working with them now when i moved to murdoch university we have signed the mou with equiset with the many universities with many research institute in india and my job what i'm doing now that under this new scheme of national agriculture high education program of government of india bringing the indian scientist in australia and having the exposure of the international agriculture so i think i'm well connected with india and i will continue to remain connected to india in various roles the several organizations are having adjunct position in national academy of agriculture sciences i'm the foreign secretary so i'm very much well connected and i will continue to remain connected so that we can continue to contribute to the indian agriculture but so many roles how do you manage all these <laughs> <laughs> very good question but this question uh, this is very frequently asked question and i think what i'm doing all of us are having limited time and uh, the most important thing is the sorting out our priorities that well which one should be going and what kind of thing so somehow i have been able to manage but yes you are right this becomes sometimes very challenging as well yeah yes everyone has 24 hours and some days uh -huh. only playing one role and you are playing several several roles yeah. all together but some people can sleep for less time and which is not good for me for my health my wife and my family always says this thing but i think i have been sleeping for many many years not more than 6 hours and sometimes i mean that's even lesser than that one so but which is not good for health but i think somehow i have been able to manage <laughs> so let's see yeah. maybe your passion don't let you sleep <laughs> <laughs> thank you so uh, so sir what ex what any incident or discovery uh, that played the turning point in your career is there any particular yeah. discovery yeah so i will suggest i think these kind of points turning point or inflection point in my research career came at two three times place points and i will say one is sometimes in 2012 so when we were trying to decode the genomes we did not have much money we did not have those advanced technology at that time but our passion and confidence and uh, we thought that well with this small sequencing reads there was one technology at that time point from a company called illumina mm -hmm. and we should be able to assemble the genome and many people they had doubted in our uh, thing that this will happen or not but in 2012 this paper was published in nature biotechnology and this was also for the first time from indian perspective that any plant scientist has published a paper while working in india as a leader of the consortium Otherwise, earlier, many international consortium, they were lead, they were generally led by the Westerners in the United States or other places. Indian used to play the part of this thing. But when I demonstrated that, well, we can do this thing, this was one of the key things that with that smaller sequencing technology, working in India, and our genome quality was very good, published in the top class journal. And then, so this was really good thing that now then this provided us the confidence that we can do this kind of thing in many more crops like that one. I don't know, but, but yeah. So this was one. Anyway, you were showing something, yeah. Sir, so, uh, after that, several nature and uh, high yeah, 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 paper yes. came. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's and I say and I when I was a kid, you are young, Sonia, but I'm a little bit older. So mm -hmm. when I was a kid in the TV, we used to see one advertisement at that time. There was this electric wall called Silvania Lakshman. So what did that say? Pure ghar ke badal dalunga. So but love the same thing. So once we got that genome sequencing technology thing. <laughs> Then I thought now I can change everything. So I mean, this was one of the things. So we did that. And then, so this was one point. Second point was, so when we started to publish lots of paper, lots of knowledge, and this was not giving the lot of satisfaction. It's a scientist, this is good that we got papers. But then this was sometimes in 2016 or 17 kind of thing, I will say that, and I would like to say at that time point, uh, some of these, uh, even the secretaries of agriculture, including Professor Adok, Mr. Basu and then Mr. Ashish Bahuguna, Secretary of Agriculture and Ministry, when they invited me, they said, Rajiv, we would like you to develop the roadmap and how you can use the genomics technology to develop the varieties. We want chickpea having higher productivity. 
And then I thought this is a really important point. But then I told that, well, we need to have the breeders. And then I started to bring these breeders together. And when breeders told, yes, we will take up these approaches. So this, if breeders wouldn't have been excited, motivated, if government wouldn't have been supportive for me, if we wouldn't have that leadership from ICRISAT, and I would like to mention that one of the very transformative leader at ICRISAT, Dr. William Dar, and he was the one who appointed me at ICRISAT, and he was so supportive. Many people used to go and tell him, hey, Rajiv is very young, but you are doing this. But he used to say, I have seen the potential in Rajiv, and he's continuously demonstrating so having those kind of leadership was very, very powerful, very, very helpful. So all these things. But again, I also had the privilege to work with many other leaders, including David Worthington, Peter Carvery, many other people. But William Dar's leadership at Ecclesiastes was fantastic. Anyway, so this was the second point that integrating the genomics technology in the breeding program, bringing breeders. And in this kind of leadership, what you do, that you take one step back and you put those colleagues in the front. And then they start to feel that, well, this is their work. Then they start to have the ownership. Yes. If I will impose, no, no, you need to do it. They will not. When I remember breeders, they used to ask why we should do this thing, how this is going to be helpful. You guys always publish the paper. This will not deliver anything. But when they have seen that, yes, this can, and when they are leading the project and I'm sit, standing behind them and I say, I'm there for providing all kind of support from genomics, analysis, and so on. So I think this was very important point that this helped us to develop several varieties. So these are the two key thing I would like to say, though there are several others, but these are the two important things. So sir, being in the system, you know uh, what all policies and uh, what uh, are there. And now you are working at uh, Australia. So you have now aware of their policies and the way of working. So what improvement and policies in Indian system required to become the world leader in the science, uh, agricultural sciences and also uh, science and technology? Uh... Yeah. So this is very important point. And uh, I being Indian and uh, though I'm in Australia, but I am Indian. So yeah. So I feel very proud to, to be, to have this high, how should I say, outstanding science coming from India having fantastic passion, commitment of the different people. And India is having lots of potential to be the leader in this particular area. In many areas, they are already leader. Thing is, and here I would like to mention, this is not a criticism. Huh? So don't consider this as a criticism no, because I don't want, but the thing is, now if you see, for instance, mm -hmm. IT technology. Now, for IT technology, India is the one of the biggest country for providing the main power, but in terms of the country, this is United States or the Silicon Valley. Yes. They are the leader. Not India, but then India is providing that kind yes. of human resources. The thing is, which I have seen, now that if you see the, for instance, even the sports, Olympics, mm. or even the cricket, now at least cricket things have changed a lot, but still we see that I remember time of Sachin Tendulkar, so Sachin Tendulkar is playing. If he's out, then people say, let's close the TV because yes. now the whole team will be out, right? Mm -hmm. Sachin Tendulkar is one of the greatest cricketers at international level, no doubt about it. You will be fine top-class scientists from India. They are great. They are one of those greatest people in that world. In my opinion, somehow in India, we are missing to develop a system now, if you see China, for instance, and like Olympics or any games, sports, they come up with large number of the medals every year. In India, we get five, six, seven. We feel very proud, which is fine. But now see, in the other countries, they have a system. System supports the people. Yes. In India, people drive the system. Yeah. So I think this is one of the important things that we are having great scientists, but now we need to bring some changes in the policy that yes. how we can make the system stronger and then we can have those people who are leading the system empower them and then they can create many more people and make the system stronger mm -hmm. you see what i'm trying to say yes, so so i think this is one point second is that accountability kind of thing and when i'm saying this thing this is not that generic that everybody is having this kind of thing now, either research project, research grant, and this is a fantastic system in Australia, which I have noticed very, very much accountability that what we are supposed to deliver, what we delivered or not. 
I think this thing is also missing very much in accountability kind of thing that we need to have this thing that, well, if this did not happen, whose fault is how to fix that one? In India, we keep on just passing the buck kind of thing. Oh, this was not my responsibility. He yes. did see like this kind of thing. And the other thing is that I think that we should have mission mode approach kind of thing. So like for instance, you should have the big ticket item, not that small, small thing. Mm -hmm. As I said, and I'm thinking Mr. Basu, when he was that agriculture secretary, mm -hmm. followed by Dr. Mr. Ashish Bahuguna, then I had worked with uh, uh, Shobhana Patnayak, sir. These were secretaries of agriculture. Sometimes you may be surprised that these secretaries, even they're having this IES and very high level people, they were talking to me as a scientist. I mean, see the vision of those people. So when these people, they are bringing the scientists together and they are asking me, they say, Raji, we have seen your paper. Can you develop the roadmap? What do you need? They ask this question to me. What do you need that we need to do this? Thing? I say, sir, what does it mean? That, well, we are importing chickpea. How can you make this chickpea more crop productivity? Now, because of number of regions, policy, USU, etc., India is not importing chickpea from Australia. Australia used to be major exporter. Though now when I come to Australia, my friends, they say, you are one of the key person that now Australia is not able to export because you guys already work like this. So, I mean, this is a different thing. So, I think these are some of these systems. And we need to bring this new technology, new people in the system. Because sometimes whenever you are talking about that, bringing this new technology. First thing is in India, we say, and this goes to our culture or something that we always would like to see. We would like to always use tried and tested approach. We don't have much risk appetite. Yes. We say, so, if... say that I can tell you without mentioning any name that even Indian funding agency mm -hmm. mein jata tha, mein kahun, ke we need to do it. Many senior people they say, has anybody else did that one? Mm -hmm. Then I said, no. Then say, well, to, tum kyo karna cha rahe ho? Pata nahi hua nahi hua. Hone do, pehle Cornell University ko karne do, US ko karne do. Bhai, you can do this thing, but then if you yes. would like to always, you will be a follower. You will not be a leader. If you want to be leader, you need to have appetite, risk appetite. Sometimes you may be failed. This is okay. But if you will never take the risk, how can you be the pioneer? How can you be a leader? Yes. So I think these are some of the things. Again, as I said, not a criticism, but we, the, there are always no, room for the improvement. Actually, and some of these things, in my opinion, they can be. Yeah. Yes, these are important because you are at the position where you can advise the policy makers yeah. to, to bring about these changes in the system. And uh, currently, as the, we know, that situation is favoring India in many aspects. So these aspects also need improvements. Yeah. And we lack uh, some of these changes in the system. So yes, and do yeah. uh, from your side, do advise the uh, policy makers to... Yeah. Yeah. make these changes so that yeah and that's what i'm doing it. yeah and even when i go i keep on meeting the different djs or the secretaries and we are having really good discussion and many of them they are very now for instance right now dr ramesh chan he's in the niti io and he's fantastic visionary so even recently i had a meeting with him so we always talk that well and he's so nice last time in december when i was in mm -hmm. his in delhi and when i sent an email sir i'm here in india oh rajiv come here let's have a cup of tea in his office, then he is discussing, Raji, what is good thing in Australia? How we can do this? And so, so what is happening many times? Informally, formally, those kind of discussions we are happening. Yes, yes. Now, Dr. Himansu Patak, Director General of ICR. Yes. So we keep on meeting with him. Recently, I was with him. So all these things are happening. And I think this is the way. So as I said, many people, many of these leaders, they are visionary. They are doing great work. Now, we need, and they are doing now, Professor Pentel, when he was the University of Delhi South Campus or later University of Delhi Vice Chancellor, those things, he brought lots of changes. So, I mean, those kind of things. So, in India, sometimes we would like to say, as you say in the English, that in Indian system, we love the system called a status quo. So, jaisa hai, baisa chalne dete hai. if you are a leader, you need to bring the change. Sometimes you may be failed, but you need to bring the change. And I yes. learned this thing from Dr. William Dar, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. he was always saying that, Raji, if you have some new idea, implement that one. If not, then what is that? What additional value? We don't want to continue business as usual. We need to bring something new. Yes. But I said, sir. Ajay, Sonia ji, you have to ask a lot of questions. These are very important for that yes, our society and for young generations. So this is really very important. Yeah. Yes, sir.
So, sir, what are the current and future trends in agricultural science and genomics that you will find are most exciting and promising for addressing the global challenges? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I think we are living right now in the most exciting time in terms yes. of the technological advances. So, we are having, you can understand, you can sequence the genome for not one or two, but hundreds of thousands of the crop in the faster manner. You can understand the function of the genes. You got a lot of bioinformatics approaches. Now the new approaches, they're saying single cell genomics. So basically you can understand each cell and their interaction with the different one. We are talking about synthetic biology, systems biology. We have a possibility to edit the genes, gene editing. Now people say that people are moving towards the genome writing also. So you can write the new genomes as well. Yes. So I mean, these are all exciting things. Some of these things will be coming very soon. Some of these things will be taking time. But now as a country, and as I said, that sometimes there are many exciting things. For instance, and you mentioned about like this thing, GM technology, somehow India was not able to harness. A good thing is in the area of gene editing, government of India last year itself, and with the brainstorming with the different mm -hmm. scientists, including Professor Pentel, Professor Kailash Vansal, Professor Mohpatra, many people, National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, Dr. R.S. Parada, there are many people. But now, last year, they already came up with the guidelines of yes. the gene editing. So I think what India has done, they are well prepared now for that any products coming from gene editing, how this will be going to the farmer. So I think we need to have conducive policy environment. Otherwise, countries like Bangladesh, Philippines, there are many countries that are harnessing the potential of genome uh, uh, GM, but not India. So in India, we are got lots of technology. We need to have that conducive policy environment. We should be embracing any technology which can help farming community, which can help the consumer, which can help the society. That's my view. Yes, very well said, sir. So, sir, uh, what is your advice to the young researchers who are listening to you? So, I think that young researcher, in my opinion, is that they should have commitment that, uh, that they need to I, I will say three things that they should have the passion, they should have the commitment. And as I said, one thing from my mom, hard work. Sometimes they may be failed. Hey, this is okay. Failure is not the end of the story. When you are failed, also this is giving you some experience. Based on these things, next time you will do something, you will be successful. So we should never ever be worried about this failure. We should be passionate about something, continue to work this thing. We should have the determination. I think these are some of the things which I have seen from my own experience. I have seen from my colleagues, my mentors. So these are the some areas that we need to be, should not easily give up. And we, if you would like to achieve something, maybe the approach, what we are following, maybe not be the best approach does not mean you should give up, maybe change your approach. But if you will keep on changing or if you will keep on giving up, giving up any, every time, you will not be able to achieve anything. So I think these are very important thing and whatever we are doing and if you are really having the passion, you will enjoy it. If you don't have the passion, you will think, oh my God, I'm doing this again. I mean, those kind of things. So you should enjoy what you are doing and then continue to be very committed, dedicated for your goal and keep, yeah. So that's what my suggestion is. Very correctly said, sir. So sir, how do you see your journey? <laughs> so this is a very good point, yeah. Hmm. What are the future goals and aspirations? So, yeah, so, you know that, and you will be surprised to know that one word I'm going to say. So, as such, I never planned my journey, like, for instance, that after five years, what I want to achieve or 10 years, what I want to achieve. What I have been doing, that doing the things which I want to do, but then when things come, so some, like, even now when I'm in Australia, when I was in India, I never thought, even when I went to Germany, I never thought I will go back to India. Many things happened, including Norman Borlaug story, which I told. And then when I was coming from here, I'm here, but who knows that uh, <clears throat> what will be the next thing. But I know one thing, wherever I am, I keep on delivering or I keep on doing my best and I keep on delivering to the best of my uh, expertise, knowledge or hard work. And uh, I don't see that uh, like uh, having any destination but in my journey I always would like to keep on traveling keep on running from one milestone to other milestone so that's my thing but I always would like to ensure that when I'm making a journey how my journey can be helpful beneficiary to the other people 
they can be my colleagues they can be my client they can be my stakeholder so that's what my feeling is and now some of these kind of uh, honors recognition such as frs as i said they put little they bring lots of more how should i say like for instance uh, um, obligation kind of thing or responsibilities that this means the society expects more from you yes. and that's how we can contribute to continue to contribute in this direction that's what my suggestion is here Yes, sir. Sure. I will not say I hope you will do. I know you will do. And definitely you will uh, give more of your wisdom and in, through your contributions in science and agriculture and benefit yeah. the society. So, sir, uh, with this, I'm done with my questions and I wish you all the very best for your uh, future endeavors. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to interact with you. It means a lot for me because... Let, yeah. Let me thank you once again, Sonia Ji, for very nice interaction, very good question. And uh, I'm very happy that, uh, and rather I very much enjoyed this very good interaction discussion. I'm sure this will be inspiring the new people and I'm always there to help them as much as I can. But again, mm -hmm. thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity and congratulations to you and beyond so then. Thank you for having me in your program. Thank you. Thank you.